Hello. Welcome. I'm so glad all of you are with us for today's poetry reading. I think we're going to have a, uh, a wonderful reading today because we have a couple of really good poets with us. Uh, I wanted, wanted to let you know, I think I called your attention to the screen before we started. There are a lot of poetry events coming up uh, at the bookstore, through the bookstore and other events as well. So if you wanna know about those, go to www.sarasotabooks.com and under events, you'll find all of our upcoming events. I listed just a few. I particularly wanna call your attention to our major event of the year, Poetry Life, which will be on Zoom this year on April 21st. And it features two fine, fine poets. One of the world's finest poets is Carolyn Forche. And she will be with us as well as Padre Gotuama, who is an Irish poet from uh, Northern Ireland. It's going to be moderated because there will be a discussion uh, primarily focused around what's happening in the world, particularly in the schools right now with book banning and the true attempts at um, to extinguish freedom of, of expression. That discussion with those two poets is going to be moderated by award-winning uh, journalist Charlene Hunter-Galt. That's a free event. You can, you can RSVP for it now on our website. So I hope you will join us. But at the moment, we're going to go ahead and get started with our reading. Uh, I'm going to introduce the readers one at a time uh, as, they, <clears throat> as they're meant to read. And Joyce is going to be our first reader today. Uh, so here's, here's what, I have, what I have about Joyce Pesseroff, which is pretty darn impressive. Joyce Pesseroff's sixth book of poems, Petition, was designated a must read by the Massachusetts Book Awards, as was her last collection, Know Thyself. She edited the Plowshares Poetry Reader and Simply Lasting Writers on Jane Kenyon. She has received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. She directed and taught in UMass Boston's Creative Writing MFA program in its first four years. And currently, she blogs for her website, which is called So I Gave You Quartz, and writes a poetry column for Arrowsmith Press. Please welcome Joyce Pesseroff. Uh, thank you so much, Georgia, for that introduction. And I really want to thank you and Bookstore One Sarasota for your support of poetry through all these years and for having too many events to name at the beginning of this reading and directing us towards your flyer because there are just so many and so varied. Um, and I really do want to thank you and also want to thank the audience for coming um, on this Sunday afternoon to hear me and Michael Mall read. I'm gonna be reading from my most recent book, Petition, which uh, came out about 18 months ago. And I'm gonna start with the title poem, Petition. Give the wealth back to those we stole it from. Give the land back to those we stole it from. Give our shotguns to those we took the land from. Maybe they'll split the barrels into irrigation pipes. Maybe they'll mill the stocks for bookends for the books by those we took language from. Give love back to those we banished from our love. Give life back to all who lost insurance for their meds. Give medicine back to those who find it in a tea a weed, a willow, the heat and light in hands needing a muscle. Give muscle to the tongue's back talk, 
curses and its sweetest nothings, the lay of a ripe peach. Give ripeness to a time. Give us time to restore the forests and the sea, the one we filtered of whales, codfish, and pink dolphins. Give us eternity again. We'll set things right. Um, the, the next poem I'm going to read it has a title from a book by Toni Morrison called The Origin of Others. And it's uh, set in the town of Bedford, Massachusetts, which is next to Lexington, which is named here. Um, and that's where I am uh, during the summer months. I'm lucky to be here in Fort Myers for the winter. And the title and the quote is, For the Stranger is Not Foreign, She is Random. Everything I know tells me to retreat from this woman on the bench in front of the nail spa, asking if I'll take her home. She's in pants and long knit sleeves, though it's 90 degrees. While I brought shirts to the dry cleaner next door, she was pacing, talking, no cell phone or Bluetooth. Now she calls to me. Will I drive her to Lexington instead of ripping husks from sweet corn at Whole Foods? Her gray hair is trim, neat. She may be younger than me. It's hot. She has no purse. Wrong to call the police agreed. I could offer to pay for a cab. Feed my sheep, the gospel choirs. Don't talk to strangers. Mom warned me and I warned Liz. What could this anxious beggar do? I couldn't undo. Timid, Jeff calls my driving, as if to summarize my life. Um, this next poem is called Receipt. And um, it came from uh, wanting to return a sweater and I had no receipt for it. And I, I was gonna do it anyway. Um, this is when we went to stores, retail stores before Amazon took over everything. So I guess it kind of dates me. But um, some of these places you still have to go to in person. Receipt. The cashier, and I'm sorry, let me start again. Receipt. The cashier at CVS asks, if I want a receipt and I smile, no. The gas pump screen chimes receipt, yes, slash no. And I tap no, since I heard the ink on the paper is carcinogenic or maybe the paper itself. Buying groceries, I crumple a two foot printout I don't need since every transaction's recorded by my credit card and I don't bother with coupons. No one questions whether I own my lunch meat or prescription or the fuel that guns me out of town. I overheard a man laugh in Sears when asked if he wanted a bag for his gold toes. Are you kidding? A black man walking out of here with a pair of socks in his hand? Whereas I disdain plastic bags that might stuff a landfill. Whereas no one will ask whether I own the shoes I wear, leaving the store, my old sandals left in a box for the clerk to dispose of. In three towns, in three states, no one looks twice when I drop something into my purse. Could be nail polish, could be a gun, could be a bottle I'm nipping at. Hello, hashtag white lady feminist who never got a ticket 
always a warning, okayed for PSA pre-check. If I want to return a sweater, I'll return the sweater with or without a receipt. Um, this is a poem about a robot, and it's a robot that was part of an experiment to see how people would treat this artificial being with a, it had sort of a goofy face and, and um, funny arms, and it was set in various nations uh, with a thumb to hitchhike, and the experiment was to see how far the robot would get how many humans would pick up the robot and drop it off on the, at the side of the road and who would then pick it up next. And this was um, taken from uh, CNN on August 1st, 2014. After traveling across Canada, the Netherlands and Germany, Hitchbot, the hitchhiking robot, gets beheaded in Philadelphia. Hitchbot, you look like a toy in a war zone, a photograph staged to crack the heart. Hitchbot, you're like my kid's old Barbie, dressed and undressed, decapitated with familiar contempt. Hitchbot, you're the highway's first dweeby victim in a horror movie franchise son or revenge of spare battery in a suitcase suitcase velcroed to foam noodle arms by helpful canadians germans or dutch gone with your flag goofy recital of local trivia your emoji face you offer the chance for a quick selfie in the voice of a woman or prepubescent boy excited to tour the Grand Canyon. Maybe that voice enraged some guy whose job was going the way of the travel agent, file clerk, or trucker in a future of self-driving cars. Sorry, the open road didn't work for you. That's true for migrating humans, too. Now, the next poem I'm going to read is, is about um, being a snowbird and leaving uh, Fort Myers at the end of the season and finding myself with uh, emptying out the refrigerator, which is part of the ritual and finding one egg in a carton, one egg. What am I gonna do with this one egg? And uh, some of the things you might um, need to know about this is uh, it starts with um, a mention of two Russian poets, Anna Akhmanova and Osip Mandelstam, who were both persecuted by Stalin in the 1940s. I think that's all you need to know. Egg. Who imagines the future as it will happen? Did Mandelstam think he'd die for comparing Stalin's fingers to grubs? The night of his arrest, his wife invited Akhmatova for dinner and boiled her an egg. A fresh egg was a rare thing. Before the secret police took him, Mandelstam ate the egg Agmadova offered with salt. I clean the refrigerator before leaving the place I've lived for six months. There's a carton with one egg left. The look of hibiscus beguiled me and jasmine perfume for half a year. I cared for now, forget the future. Now, what should I do with this egg? Not enough for a meal, stale, 
maybe good for a batch of pancakes. My mother said wasting food is a sin. There are people on this planet, thousands, who die for an egg. Though at my age it won't, I assume the future will be like now. My friends would laugh if I gave them a single egg. Would my mother laugh or her mother, widowed with three children? I drop the egg. The disposal grinds it to a slurry that will be flushed and purified, mingled with the river and salting the sea. This is my lyric for failing to find one of the homeless vets camped by the river and giving him the egg. I kayak once past a tent patched with a blue tarp and Jeff, curious, wanted to paddle ashore. I could barely find breath to say no, so profound was the privacy of a sandy crescent between mangroves. A tent, a hibachi, a folding chair, a styrofoam cooler. Who could have dreamed this future? And an egg, what could one egg do to redeem it? Um, I'm going to read two more poems. Um, the first of this is called Lonely in Japan, and I'm, I'm a real wool gatherer when it comes to writing. I get uh, poems are sparked by all kinds of, of things that I, that I pick up. Um, and this, this was from an article that was in the New Yorker about an agency in Japan that will um, rent uh, an actor or actress uh, to people who miss their beloveds and uh, want to interact with, with one. Um, and uh, this, this got this poem started. Lonely in Japan. In Japan, you can hire a family if your wife has died and your daughter won't speak to you. You fill a form with their common gestures and favorite foods, nicknames, and hairstyles. Nights are loneliest, the blue face of the TV evident to revelers and dog walkers. Nights when you don't speak to a soul except yourself, talking to yourself a habit. Some think America is the loneliest place. Miles between towns, neighbors you avoid because they own guns. An old Japanese woman raises her window shade each morning, watching the old woman across the courtyard raise her shade, expecting she will notice the day it stays down. But she forgets which window she's checking and whether someone new has moved into the other apartment. Some nights I watch the sun drop, the clouds go plumb, a loud splash from the pond, the susurrus of crickets, what whistles like a whippoorwill. None of these voices comforts me. What I hire comfort, and what's the difference between a comforter and a friend? Job's comforters made things worse left without cattle, house and barn burned, children slaughtered, Job's wife said, curse God and die. Loneliness says the same. Maybe I'll hire a small God who washes my feet with water sprayed from his trunk. Out of our bodies we'd sail over the Peace River, trumpeting our blessed detachment above the black mangroves whose salty leaves taste like tears. Admit there are more transistors in the world than leaves on trees. Admit this adds to the world's loneliness as seen from the back of a small god 
rented for a few hours, like a hotel room in a city where your visa has expired. In a foreign capital with a population of one, there's still hope that one will be your friend. And the last poem I'm going to read is called Irish Music, um, which, uh, which came from a book, which I think was turned into a movie about a woman who develops early Alzheimer's disease. Irish Music. A blind man with sight surgically restored can't recognize what he sees in blobs of color, puzzled shapes. He walks into a painting by Clay or Miro. With no depth perception, everything's flat. To a woman with Alzheimer's, a dark red rug looks like a hole in the floor, a bloody hole. She can't open her front door without stepping past it and won't let anyone in, except a blind man maybe who wouldn't notice anything amiss. In movies, a doctor unwraps enough bandages to sucker a regiment before the big reveal. The hero can see again. In life, the newly sighted sometimes prefer darkness to looming abstractions accelerating past at hard to reckon speeds. So the operation is reversed, which allows the man to sit next to the demented woman, the sweet woman who loves Irish music and hold her hand as long as it needs to be held. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the book. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, Not pull me. it back just a little oh. further. <laughs> pull it back from the screen just a little okay. further. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joyce. That was wonderful. Well, our next reader is Michael Mall. Uh, Michael is a poet who has been writing and publishing poetry for over 50 years. In 2019, one of his works was placed into nomination for the Best of the Net competition, celebrating the best poetry published in that year. The poem, Anniversary Poem, was nominated by a literary publication in Galway, Ireland. Michael is a graduate of Ohio University Creative Writing Program, where he earned bachelor's and master's degrees. He later held faculty and administration positions at Ohio University, the Columbus College of Art and Design, and St. Louis University. He resides in Bradenton, Florida, and in Chicago, and I think he comes to us today from Bradenton. Welcome, Michael Mall. Thank you, Georgia. And yes, I'm in Bradenton. Um, and I wanted to also thank you personally, um, though Joyce already did this, for how supportive you've been of my work and also uh, other writers and readers. Bookstore One is just a huge treasure. I'm honored to be a partner with Joyce as far as our readings go. And I wanted to thank also Andrea Ginsky, who is a webmaster and has done a great job. Most of the poems I will read this afternoon are from my third book of poetry titled Breaking Cover. I'm sort of cheating because it's not available yet until late spring, but it's my book and I can take the poems out of it. Um, well, I'm glad that, um, that Joyce lives in Florida too. And for the people who also live here, you know how nice it is to be in a very a peculiar sort of um, weather systems. And we're in a chilly one right now, but I came down eight years ago and I live in a terrarium basically. Um, that's a block from Sarasota Bay. A lot of nature, uh, a lot of weather, a lot of harmony. And uh, 
I've learned to see things that I wasn't aware of before. So my first poem is called Tree Rain. After the storm, when the flash and gushes past, a second rain begins that is different in important ways. The second falling is from trees that spill raindrops from their leaves, opened, flowing from lime green tongues, laden, curled, releasing rationed rain. Tree rain, not from the heavens, is a gentle storm, not burdened with soaking acres or miles. It is soft and localized. It drips straight down in perfect circles as trees, unlike angry clouds, take their turns, whether maple, oak, or elm, to spoon feed water back to earth, tree by tree, sip by sip, one by one, until each family meal is done. The second poem is about dreams. Everybody has them and uh, some come and some go, some last forever. This is a poem about old dreams. Old dreams. These were the ones never tested that survived by keeping their heads down low enough below the lifeline, replaced by stand in smaller victories and petty losses, daydreams really, almost less than dreams. But old dreams are deep dreams. They remain unmolested and unengaged, entwined in clots of blood and bony shoals like seafarers, long lost in beds of seaweed, who in slow motion dance and wave. And in dire times, when in need, only once or twice in life, a few may free themselves, rising one by one to the surface and hauling themselves out, at first unnoticed, but who soon take command. Because old dreams flip switches and are at their best when in control, steering courses and become the reason why we rise and how we spend our days, who we love, who we beget, snapping effortlessly into place, tiny puzzle pieces that for years to all the world close up looked like disparate scraps until revived and looking back, we begin to see through revelatory light, what only old dreams do, illuminating lost ways back to a deeper love and life in you. The third poem I'm going to read is something that um, I felt called to do as reports of violence are rising in our society. And, um, and I'm especially bothered as a father by violence towards young women, which is increasing. Um, and I thought of a, a, a wonderful online publisher called The Voices Project, which is a publisher of stories of women. And their hope is through poetry to promote social change so I wrote this poem and sent it to them and was happy to have them publish it so others could read it there. It's called Preparing Our Daughter for College. Before our daughter went to college, we had a different talk. Part one held long ago was obliquely about doing well in school and reproductive health. But this time the focus tightened to not getting raped or killed. 
At its end, my wife produced two survival tools, a canister of pepper spray disguised to look like a lipstick tube and a metal whistle that for years a Boy Scout brother used. What are these for? Our daughter asked. Well, one is to get you out of danger when you spray it in a boy's eyes. And if that doesn't take, the other is to call for help while you blow the whistle and try to wait it out. Then in silence, we all stared at the table with survival tools displayed, which began to look even to me inadequate and inane. And tears began down her contorted face as our daughter pushed back both the whistle and the mace. It's too late, she whispered as she momentarily struggled to arise, then found her balance and slowly left the room. In the moment as she walked away, I felt hopeless and forlorn and as helpless as the day of her birth, watching her struggle once again through different obstacles of being born. This next poem, I think, speaks for itself and doesn't really require a lead in. It's called Dry Meat Rubs. In a nursing home in East Baton Rouge, where I worked briefly as an aide, before letting residents rise from bed, we were told to massage feet and legs, a directive that some coworkers further down the line took to calling dry meat rubs, a cruel insider's joke, as if in itself, end of life were not enough unkind without comparing human souls to barbecue and alligator rinds. The next poem is called, I Know There Are People. I would like one day to translate these thoughts into English. I know there are people who are largely invisible to me. I don't know their names or where they stay. I know they are not who I see on TV. They love people and are brave. Strangers, yes, but whose lives are like the lives of everyone else alive. You don't need to tell them of your fears or what you love. We all already know, having walked before up and down those roads, we will all be sick. We will all be loved. We will all doubt ourselves. We will be given riches unearned, knowing joy, knowing sadness. And when we hate each other, we will be hating ourselves. And the more people we love, the more we love ourselves, as if all the things that we are seeking are the same things seeking us. And my final poem has to do with the International Space Station, which you may know will be retired by crashing into the ocean in nine years. It's done a lot of good. In Mexico, and the son of a migrant worker became an astronaut and piloted the International Space, Space Station somehow. This is called La Palapa de Comida Under Stars. For years, La Palapa de Comida beachside bar in Mezzanute was tiny and not well known 
until it made history one night when the International Space Station first flew overhead at 1049, near last call and closing time. A Mexican-American astronaut, Jose Hernandez, was at the controls. A local hero, for much of his life, he spoke no English at all. A mariachi band played that night until people started pointing up as the light from the spaceship of Comandante Hernandez began floating past. Piloted by a brave man of indigenous roots, dodging in and out among the stars at 17,000 miles per hour and hundreds of miles above the bar. Descended from Aztec astronomers, probably able should computers fail to navigate in other ways by petroglyphs of firebirds, ancient roosters, a blow gunner, a star map of constellations carved into a stone wheel and ancient orbit maps of earth and moon. Far below, we hoped he could see us and the glow of festival lights, red and green and white. We waved our bottles of Mexican beers held high to show respect and said buenos noches in plural, wishing for him good dreams and all good nights from the end of this day to the rest of his life. And that is it for me. Well, thank you, Michael. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So before we go to Q&A, uh, there's just a one bit of information I want to give all of you. Um, many of you know that uh, we are moving Bookstore One from its current location at the corner of Maine and Palm to a new location just about a block and a half away. We're in the uh, new, fairly new condo building called The Mark. We're on the ground of ground floor of that, and the new address is 117 South Pineapple. And we expect to be open there by on or about February 18th. So I hope you will come and see us there. And in the not too distant future, we'll be having these poetry readings live in that new space. So, okay. So thank you to both of our poets. Now I'm going to ask those of you who are in the audience to go ahead and unmute if you've um, if you have muted yourselves and I just want to ask if anybody would like to say anything or participate or ask a question or make a comment so I, I can see you all if you want to hold up your hand or use the hand thing Patty you need to unmute yourself Patty Ellis, you are, you are muted. Okay. You, you, you are muted. Yeah, I don't think she can figure out how to unmute. Ah, I don't. Uh, look for the little microphone si uh, symbol and click on that. There, I, am I, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just popped out. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just love being here and being part of this. Um, I have read uh, Michael's poetry before, and I just feel he gets so much of himself when in everything he writes. So I loved everything he, he, he wrote. He says things that I can't say myself but I feel exactly what he says. So thank you, Michael. I loved it. Well, thank you, Patty. I appreciate your remarks. Okay. And who else would like to say something? I see lots of faces out there. Uh, yes, uh, Karen Perkins. Yes, <clears throat> Michael is my younger brother. Ah. I have to echo what Patty said. I totally agree. 
um, seeing a side of him that I never knew growing up when he was growing up as a little boy. And it just opens up a whole new world to me of our family and uh, of how creative God has put into him to be able to express himself the way he does. So thank you, Mike. I thoroughly enjoyed each of these poems and can't wait for your book. That can me too. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, me too. Who else? Who else wants to add? Uh, Doug. Doug Knowlton. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks to Georgia um, mm -hmm. to um, actually work at the store and uh, learn about poets like Joyce Passeroff and Michael Mall uh, that I might not have known about. And, uh, right. and uh, I've heard, I'm pretty sure both of them a couple of times. I do recall because I have daughters in common, that moving poem that Michael oh. wrote. And uh, that was hard to breathe. That was pretty hard to breathe afterwards, but my yeah. hat's off, Michael. Yes. Yeah. yeah, for sure it was. Mm. Thank who you. Else? Yeah, who else wants to say something? I'm looking for some hands or, or someone just to pipe up to unmute and say what you'd like to say. Uh, yeah, Stephanie? Hi, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for making this possible. This is really uh, yeah. exciting uh, to me to be able to participate in something like this, especially when we're still being COVID careful. So uh, thank you so much for doing this online. So just to go, so I, I wanted, uh, Mike, um, it's interesting that, it's just, that he just brought the uh, poem up about uh, speaking with your daughter and I was struck and I was hoping you'd speak a little bit about it um, by the line uh, that you said, it's too late. Uh, when your, your daughter said, it's too late. Could, could you talk about that a little bit? It's a discussion that should have happened earlier. And she was an unknown victim uh, of that violence. Oh, yeah, I was hoping it wasn't that, but yes, thank you for sharing. Mm. A fair question. That's thank you. Yeah, anyone, anyone else? Is that uh, Michael? Can you guys see? Me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, Michael, is that poem in one of your collections, or going to come out in another collection? Because you, you've read that poem before. And yeah. We, I've, we, I've missed you guys and I missed you in the group, Michael. The, um, but is that in one of the collections or, or is that published in, in, in a journal? I forget. Um, it was originally published in a journal. And um, was, ah. after that, uh, I think in my second book, which was a chat book. Uh, and if I'm wrong about that, then I know it's going to be published in what's coming out. In, um, in later in spring, so probably you, get, you got you got so much you can't even keep track, Michael. I'm telling you, <laughs> good stuff. It's You're good to see you. Yourself. Thank you. Thank you. So who else? Who else? Yeah, um, Miss Perez. Oh, really can't see you for <laughs> but okay. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say hi to Joyce. Hi. Um, but both of you, uh, your poems are absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I wanted to ask a question for both of the writers. Um, both of you go to some dark places in your poems. Um, and I'm thinking, Joyce, of you, your reference to Job and um, the, what is it, the Hitchbot getting decapitated. Um, yeah. Michael, your poem about um, sexual assault and that talk with children. And I was wondering, um, as you write, as you find yourselves writing about um, either current events or um, tying the things that are happening in the world to the things in your lives, do you feel that writing shapes your perception of humankind as something more hopeful or something more dire? Um, 
or where on the spectrum do you feel that writing leads you? Well, I'll let Joyce start. Uh, yeah. I always feel better after writing the poem, even if there's a lot of darkness in it. And I think part of what writing does for me is a, a way to deal with these things that you know happen to all of us. And it's sort of a, a, a I think Robert Frost called a poem a temporary stay against confusion. And uh, the stay is part of it and the temporary is part of it. So you have to go and write another poem. But I think that's partly how I deal with the darkness that right now in this time we're aware of, but it's, it's true of, of any time. And as you mentioned, um, it goes back to Job. It goes back to the Bible, if not further. So uh, that's, that's my answer, Barbara. I think as writers, we are um, fortunate to be able to confront and deal and work through um, those kinds of subjects because nothing, well, I would say nothing gets better by itself. So being able to, to feel those feelings, to share those feelings, um, to know that other people have feelings that are difficult and are in mm -hmm. difficult circumstances, uh, I think makes us, at least for me, makes me remind myself that everyone is still human and that we share a huge swath of life uh, and not um, trivialize what another person's situation is. So uh, I think I, I think it's valuable. It is dark. I try when I read, you know, not to to to, to put a little bit of uh, different tones and different poems around there, like nature or something else. Mm -hmm. But um, I can't to be honest with you. Think about anything I wouldn't write about. Other, other thoughts? Anyone else want to say anything to either of our poets or to each other or? Keep uh, on writing. Yeah, yes, Joyce. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask Michael if he could repeat the title of his book and- um, Yeah. And, and again, when it's coming out in a few months, I think, if you could, Repeat that. Yes. Uh, the title of the book is called Breaking Cover. And uh, it's due to be out uh, either mid or late May. So um, it's moving through the final edits into the printer. And uh, so it'll be available. Um, probably, I think that's going to be on uh, available through Amazon. Um, I'm, it could probably also be available on my website. Um, and that website is michaelmall.net, all lowercase. Um, I also am on Twitter at mmall414. And I have a Facebook page for people who have who use Facebook called Michael Mall Poetry. And a lot of information gets in there too. So I'll certainly let everybody know. Um, my email address is mmall414 at gmail.com. Um, and if anybody would like to send me an email or contact me in one of those ways uh, and ask me to let you know as soon as the book's available, uh, I'll be happy to do that. And um, so I, I can be found in all of those places. And if none of that works, just type my... Um, name into Google and uh, ignore all the arrest warrants. None of that's true. <laughs> what, what's the new address of the new store, the bookstore one, where is it going to be moved to? It's the address is 117 South Pineapple Avenue. Are you familiar with downtown Sarasota? Yeah. Do you know yeah. the Mark condo building? It's, big the, one. It's, it's the big white one that has flowers and graphics Oh, okay. Outside. Yeah. That's the mark. 
Okay. And, and we're going to be uh, on the ground floor. Of oh, that. that's great. And that's going to be February 18th, you said? We're, we're expecting to be open by February 18th, give or take a day or, or two. Okay. You know, but that's, that's the plan. That's well, good luck with the move. Thank you. And maybe I can convince uh, to have a few copies there when the book yeah. comes out and Georgia might um, help out too. <laughs> That'd be great. I'm sure yeah, it was wonderful. Yes. Oh, Don, did you want to say something? You are muted. Don? I just, I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Oh, what a beautiful yes. setting. Though. Yeah. I have a question for, for either poet. Yes. Um, a lot of times when we read poetry, we assign or we believe that the person writing the poetry has experienced the things that they're discussing in their poet. Is that the case with your writing or are you able to put yourself in situations uh, that allow you to empathize and understand the, the writing that you're doing or the feelings of the people involved? Um, I'll, I'll start. Uh, usually um, the the speaker in my poem is someone very close to myself, but not always. Um, you know, sometimes poems are more like dramatic monologues and I take the voice of someone who's clearly not me. And often poems that start with an experience I have go, go elsewhere and include details that really um, I'm experienced as I've never had details, I change. Uh, so there's a certain amount of fictionalizing in there. Mm -hmm. But it usually starts, something has to move me to get me going. So uh, it, it's, it starts with something personal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, and I try and write with the base of truth. So whether, uh, and I also prefer writing in the first person because if you go to the third person, you're twice removed already from the reader. So it's simpler for people to read I and me, yeah. um, whoever, you know, the story may have actually happened to even. And it's uh, also, I think, um, more dramatic and if you're if you're going from a base of truth, um, then you're really dealing with the under subject anyway, and that can that's just the way that that works. So, if we if we're only limited to things that happen to us, our books would be a lot thinner. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you, thank you, everybody. Thank you to the poets. Let's give them a a, a round of applause. I, I just Michael. wanted to say one other thing, and that is uh, the Hitchhiker Robot poem. I was really glad, I'm being Canadian, I was really glad that it was treated very well in Canada. <laughs> yes, the, the, the Canadians are very hospitable. <laughs> well, well, thank you all for coming. Have a great yes. Sunday. Thank afternoon. you, I really enjoyed it. Thank, that you. Was thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia, and thanks, thanks to everyone. Thanks, thank Barbara. You.